In the previous video, we studied something called the complex exponential function defined as w equal to e to the z. We saw that this is defined for all the complex numbers z, and we also saw that this version, that is the complex version of the exponential function, is a periodic function. Specifically, it's 2 pi ki periodic. And because of its periodic nature, any attempt to define an inverse function is going to lead to a multi-value function. And just as in the case of real analysis, we know that there's an exponential function e to the x, and we defined an inverse mapping like x equal to the natural log of y, we're interested in defining and studying an inverse mapping for the complex exponential function that we're going to define as z being the complex logarithm of the complex number w. And the goal of this video is to study the structure of this complex logarithm and to define it, define a branch of it that forms a continuous inverse for an injective version of the complex exponential function. First, let's talk about structure. So on one hand, I say that z is the logarithm of w. On the other hand, I say that z is a complex number, so it can be written as a real part and an imaginary part. So what exactly would be the real and imaginary part breakdown of a logarithm function? Okay, let's derive exactly what we need. So z is the complex logarithm of w if and only if z satisfies the equation e to the z equals w. So if this is the case, if e to the z equals w, and we know that the absolute value of w is just e to the x, so this implies that x equals the logarithm. Now this is just the standard real valued natural logarithm we're familiar with. So x equals the logarithm of the absolute value of w. Okay, cool. So we have one piece of the puzzle. That's the real part of z. That's the real part of log w. Now for the imaginary part, recall that the argument of w equaled the imaginary part of the complex input z, and this is in fact what we're calling a y. So we have all the pieces, both the pieces that is, we have the imaginary and the real part of the logarithm of w. So if I say that z equals log w, then I mean that z equals the logarithm of the absolute value of w plus i times the argument of w. And this structure satisfies our requirement that e to the z should be equal to w. That is, if we consider the converse case of defining the logarithm of w with this structure, and if I say that e to the z, if I study e to the z, that is, that is, I'm studying e to the log of w. And expanding log w using the equation above, we have e to the log of absolute value w plus i times the argument of w. And this can be expanded using the definition, of course, of the exponential function. So we have e to the log w times e to the i arg w. Now, this first term here is just a real-valued exponential function to a real-valued logarithm of a real number. So yeah, it's the case we're all familiar with. E and the logarithm are inverse functions, they cancel out. We're left with the absolute value of w times e to the i times argument w. But wait a minute, isn't this exactly the polar form of the complex number w? So yeah, we do have e to the z equal w. So we've successfully derived an appropriate structure for the inverse mapping that is the complex logarithm of w. And our triumph doesn't end there. We immediately spot why the complex logarithm is multi-valued. It's this argument function. We know that the argument 
is a multi-valued function. And that's exactly what's, what makes the complex logarithm multi-valued. So in order to construct a single-valued version of the logarithm, we define something called the principal logarithm. So the principal logarithm is defined with, you guessed it, the principal argument. So instead of the regular argument, we have the principal argument of W. So this is a single-valued inverse mapping for the complex exponential function. We have the argument of W bounded between pi and negative pi. But remember back in the start of the video, we had to, I talked about, I said something about an injective version of the exponential function. And this restriction on the argument works pretty damn well to give you an injective version of the exponential function. How is that so? Well, let's analyze that graphically, as in let's visualize it using complex planes. For this case, I'm going to take the complex plane on the left to be the W plane, and the one on the right to be the Z plane. And the complex numbers in the W plane are defined by W equal to E to the Z, and we go from the W to the Z plane under the transformation Z equals log W. Okay, so that's our setup. But now we need to make some observations. First up, notice that since w equals e to the z, it can never be zero. So we have this branch point at the origin. And we need to restrict the argument of w in order for it to be single-valued. So let's place the restriction of argument w being between pi and negative pi. Notice that I'm not considering the case of argument w being equal to pi. I'm not considering that right now. I'll consider it separately in a short while. For now, this restriction on the argument of w introduces a branch cut in the w plane along the negative real axis. Okay, that is one thick branch cut, but that's how we like them, so yeah. No complaints whatsoever. But what's happening in the z plane? Well, if z equals log w, then we saw what implications this definition has. We saw that the real part of z is the logarithm of the absolute value of w, and the imaginary part of z is the argument of w. Okay, cool. And if the argument of w is bound between pi and negative pi, then that means all complex numbers in the z-plane have their imaginary parts between these two broken lines, both at a height of pi above and below the real axis. So I have negative i pi here and positive i pi up there. Quick recap, what I have in the w plane is the slit plane c excluding negative infinity up to zero, and what I have in the z plane is the strip of complex numbers with imaginary parts between pi and negative pi. So what's happened here is the slit plane has been mapped onto this strip. That is quite a visual, but there's still something missing. We haven't discussed the case of the argument of w being equal to pi. Well, if that's the case, then w will be on the real axis, and w will be negative. And the cool thing about complex logarithms is that you can take the logarithm of negative numbers. For example, I can study the logarithm of negative 1. This will just be the logarithm of the absolute value of 1 plus i times the argument of negative 1. And because of the way we've restricted the arguments of all complex numbers in the w plane, now allowing the argument to be equal to pi as well, the argument of negative 1 is going to be just pi. And absolute value of negative 1 is just 
1 and log 1 is 0. So this implies that log negative 1 equals i times pi. So yeah, negative numbers do have logarithms. They're just complex numbers. And in all of this exercise, we've constructed a function z equal to log w that acts as a continuous inverse for the mapping w equal to e to the z. And I think this is a really cool exercise in constructing complex valued functions. And we can put all of this into writing as log z being a function that takes the punctured plane c excluding the origin. Remember, it's now the punctured plane, not the slit plane, because we've included the negative real axis. And it maps the punctured plane onto the strip imz bound between pi and negative pi. And we could define the corresponding injective version of the exponential function as a function e to the z that takes this strip onto the punctured plane c excluding the origin. And that is pretty cool. But before we move forward and study the properties of the complex logarithm, let's reflect on the branch cuts we've used one more time. So what we've done so far is define a function w equal to log z expanded as log absolute value z plus i times the argument of z. We saw that this function is multi-valued, so we restricted the argument of z to make it single-valued. And that's the entire point of using branch cuts. We want to restrict the argument of the variable z, the input variable z now. We want to restrict the argument to make it a single-valued function. One way to do that is using the principal argument. So that's the argument with an uppercase A. And in books, you'll often see that the principal branch of the logarithm is denoted by, is written as log with an uppercase L. So principal log Z equals log absolute value Z plus I times the principal argument. So yeah, that's one way of writing it, but I often ignore that, I just write log in the usual way with the lowercase l. But anyway, it's fine. As long as you understand the context, it's fine. It's perfectly fine. And of course, specifying the branch cuts means you're paying attention to the importance of the context in which you're speaking of the logarithm. Anyway, point is, we needed to place a restriction on the argument. In this case, in the case of the principal branch of the logarithm, we say that the argument is bound between pi and negative pi. Okay, cool. And we immediately see that any branch of the logarithm can be generated from the principal logarithm by adding 2 pi k times i. That's another thing out of the way. But the matter I want to draw attention to is that because all we want is to restrict the argument function, we can restrict it in numerous ways. We can restrict it in any interval of length 2 pi. For example, I could define a logarithm of z as log absolute value z plus i times the argument of z, with the argument of z being bound between 2 pi and 0, where 2 pi is excluded. This is also a single-valued logarithm. In this case, the branch cut I've used is along the positive real axis. Okay, that's cool. And if this is the case, then I can use any branch cut I want. I can use some cool branch cuts as well, right? Suppose I take, once again, the complex plane, and now the branch cut I'm using is along a straight line through the origin, oriented at pi by 4 radians to the positive real axis. Now I've restricted the argument of z to lie between pi by 4 inclusive, and the upper bound would be 
9 pi by 4. So yes, this is also a valid restriction on the argument that gives you a single valued logarithm function that is the continuous inverse mapping of an exponential function. The only differences in all these definitions is the strip we're talking about. The exponential function is not bothered because of its periodic nature and all that. Anyway, I hope you understand exactly what I'm talking about. So we can use any branch cut as long as it satisfies our need of having a single valued logarithm. Now for the properties. Please remember that these properties hold modulo adding, you guessed it, 2 pi k times i, where k is some integer. So the first property is that if you have a product of complex numbers z sub 1 and z sub 2, both non-zero, if you take the logarithm, then what you get is the sum of individual logarithms. And all of these properties are very easy to prove using the way, using the structure with which we define the complex logarithm. That's why the proofs are left as an exercise. The second property we have is log 1 by z being equal to negative log z. Third, we have, as a consequence of the above property, log z sub 1 by z sub 2, z sub 2 of course being non-zero. We have log z sub 1 minus log z sub 2. Another property we have is the logarithm of z to the a, where a is some real number. This equals a times the logarithm of z. And one for the conjugate, we have log z bar equal to the conjugate of log z. And now that we're done with the properties, one homework for you is to prove them. And some additional homework is in order as well. For today's homework, we need Gamelin's text, exercise 1.6, questions 1, 2, 3, and 4. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons for extra credit. You can DM me on Instagram in case you need any help, link in the description as well as in the comment section. And in case you're interested in some tough math for fun, subscribe to my main channel, Math Spiral 5. I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope you learned something. Thank you, see you next time.